This is the Pixel 4 and the Pixel 4 XL. And if they look familiar, it's probably because they've been leaked more than maybe any other phones in recent memory. And as usual, they run clean builds of Android and have some really great cameras. Don't be fooled though. These pixels are proof that it's not just business as usual in Mountain View. As Google laid out during its big hardware launch event, it tried to build a more actively helpful kind of smartphone, one that can respond to your voice commands more quickly, one that doesn't require you to pick it up to use all the time because God knows we all have other stuff to deal with. We'll get to that later though. It almost doesn't matter how helpful a phone can be if the basics aren't taken care of. So let's start there. As always, these pixels share a common foundation. They both use the Snapdragon 855 chipset with six gigs of RAM. They both come with either 64 or 128 gigs of internal storage. They both run Android 10, plus the same handful of pixel exclusive features. They both have the same 12 megapixel wide and 16 megapixel telephoto cameras around back and the same eight megapixel selfie camera out front. I've already belabored the point you get it. They're basically the same phone. The only differences here are pretty obvious, their batteries and their screens. The standard Pixel 4 uses a 5.7 inch OLED screen running at Full HD+, while the XL uses a bigger 6.3 inch display running at Quad HD+. They look better than usual this year too, but not because the screens are any more vivid than the last ones. It's partially because of a system called Ambient EQ that tunes the color temperature of the screen depending on the kind of light you're standing in. But it is mostly because of Google's smooth display system, which temporarily ramps up the refresh rate from 60 to 90 hertz when things are happening on screen. Let's say you're scrolling through my very long Pixel 4 review on a Pixel 4. That screen whizzing by on the screen will look noticeably smoother than on other devices. Ditto for when you're playing certain games. If you really wanted to, you could force these phones to run at 90 hertz all the time for buttery smooth action across the board, but A, that's a developer option, and B, it will definitely eat into your battery life, which is not great, we'll get to that later. There are a few design flourishes you're bound to notice, like the square camera hump on their backs or the pops of color on these power buttons, but let me direct your attention to one of the most important the Pixel's forehead. Not everyone will like it, but for me it beats having a deep and frankly deeply irksome notch. More importantly though, this big forehead is a big deal. Next to the 8 megapixel front facing camera, there's a series of near infrared emitters and cameras for the Pixel's new face unlock, which Google says is the fastest you're likely to find. And yeah, it is pretty fast. It's on par with the incredibly fast face unlocks you get on the iPhone 11. And since the Pixel doesn't require an intermediary step like swiping up on your screen, you can get to your stuff much faster. Here is my problem though. Your eyes don't actually need to be open for the feature to work. That does mean the Pixel's face unlock is incredibly fast, but it's not hard to dream up some problematic scenarios. If you have a curious kid or a partner, they could unlock your phone with your sleeping face and start digging through your apps. Or God forbid, if someone gets arrested, the authorities could just hold the phone in front of their face to get into their data. All it takes is a split second. These kinds of super fast, not super secure approaches to unlocking aren't new, but the problem is photos leaked before the Pixel launch show that Google was working on a feature that required your eyes to be open for face unlock to work, but it's not present in my or anyone else's review devices. It proves that Google is at least aware of the issue and has already started to try and fix it, but the company needs to ship that fix now. Here's hoping they fix some other issues along the way. My colleague, Sherlyn Lowe, has also been testing the Pixel 4. Because she set up face unlock with makeup on, she then couldn't use the feature when she wasn't wearing makeup. And when she set up face unlock again with her makeup off, you guessed it, the phone wouldn't unlock with her makeup on. I haven't had anything like this happen to me, but that sounds like very bad news. The Pixel's forehead is also home to a shockingly tiny Soli radar array, the hardware that makes Google's new motion sense possible. Here's how it works. Thanks to a lot of training data, that radar can see your hand in front of the screen and translate your motions into actions on your Pixel. If you wanna change tracks in Spotify, just swipe your hand in front of the screen. If you're like me and you need your phone's alarm to just shut up a little bit in the morning, you can snooze it by waving your hand over the Pixel's face. 
This isn't a new idea, honestly. LG did something very similar with its flagship G8 earlier this year, but Google's approach here feels less arcane. You don't have to hold your hand a certain way or remember any intricate gestures. All Motion Sense seems to recognize right now are when your hand is close to the phone and simple quick flicks. As long as you're within about a foot of that Soli radar, the whole thing mostly just works. What struck me after using Motion Sense for a while is that it feels remarkably natural, but it does really need some fine tuning. Most of the time, it took only one attempt to skip through tracks, but it occasionally took a couple because Motion Sense seemingly couldn't tell my hand from anything else around it. Things got a little better once I realized that Soli seems to be better at recognizing my hand when my fingers are spread apart, but enough misses happened across the board that I never really felt like I could rely on Motion Sense fully, even though I wanted to. The other thing to keep in mind is that for now, you just cannot do much with Motion Sense. It's mostly just the music controls and the alarm stuff I mentioned earlier. I will say Google did work with companies like Pokemon and Us2 for some cutesy games and demos, but None of it really uses Motion Sense in any new or exciting ways. In fairness, it is very early days for Motion Sense, and I've gotten the impression from conversations with Google execs that the company is more concerned about the long game here. It pushed it out the door, and it will improve it at some point. Of course, there is more than one way to interact with your phone without actually touching it. Google's Assistant got a big upgrade on the Pixel 4s. It runs noticeably faster than on last year's models because Google managed to shrink some of its massive speech recognition and understanding models so they fit on the device. Not only does that mean it's quicker, it also means the voice clips that the Assistant interprets don't need to be shipped off to a data somewhere. It all stays on your phone. Really, the best thing about this upgraded Assistant experience is the redesign that means it's a little less obtrusive when you're actually talking to it and the ability for it to handle sort of contextually irrelevant questions. So if you're looking at YouTube, you can just say, show me Bon Appetit videos because I am team BA for life. The rest of the Pixel experience is centered around Android 10 and the interesting little additions Google made to it. For a closer look at what Android 10 offers, you should really check out our full review. I'm just gonna dig into what's different here. Among other things, you have more control over how Android 10 looks right out of the box, thanks to some new style controls. Personally, I prefer the classic Pixel look, but if you're the kind of person who likes to change up your fonts and your icons in the system tray and your accent colors, you will have some interesting choices to play with. The live caption tool Google also demoed back at I.O. is here too, and guys, I love it. Long story short, it creates instant subtitles for whatever video, podcast, or audio recording you're listening to. And since this is Google we're talking about here, the captions tend to be more or less right on the money. It doesn't seem to work for music though, so if you're trying to decipher some incomprehensible lyrics, I'm sorry, you're just on your own. Google used the same on-device speech recognition that powers live captions to build a new recorder app that provides on-the-fly transcripts for your stored conversations, which is great if you were like me in college and just fell asleep in lectures but still needed that information. I've been using an app called Otter that largely works the same way for a while now, and Google's transcriptions do seem more thorough and more accurate. I just wish it could identify individual speakers and flag what they're saying in the transcript. All of the software wouldn't count for much if the phone ran like a dog, but that is thankfully not the case here. Due mostly to its high-end chipset and that clean software, the Pixel 4 and 4XL run remarkably well. In the days since I've started using them as my daily drivers, I haven't noticed any lag while multitasking and getting stuff done, and there's plenty of power here, even for pretty serious gaming. It's not as crazy powerful as something like Asus's ROG Phone 2, but for Google, pure power was never the point what the Pixel 4s offer is well in line with the rest of this year's premium smartphones, plus it has great software to add value. The batteries are a different story. For the Pixel 4 XL, Google went with a 3700 milliamp hour battery, which has generally been enough to get me through a full workday, plus most of an evening out without much fuss. On days when I didn't actually use the phone that much, I found that it would still be alive the next morning, but only just. I was expecting the 4XL to last longer than that, but I have to suspect that motion sense and the always-on display and the smooth display stuff all really took their toll here. Since all of that stuff is in the smaller Pixel 4 too, it's unfortunately no surprise that its battery life is 
is pretty bad. I often struggle to get it through a single day with consistent use without needing some kind of trip to a power outlet. As these batteries' longevity starts to naturally degrade over time, I suspect some people will end up regretting their decisions to buy these things. If there is one reason you should consider buying a Pixel 4 or 4 XL anyway, it is the camera setup. Google has proven that you can get tremendous photos out of just one camera, but this year we have two. A 12.2 megapixel wide sensor with an f1.7 aperture and dual pixel phase detect autofocus and a 16 megapixel telephoto sensor. Honestly, I would have preferred an ultra wide camera instead of the telephoto, but whatever. In just about every way that matters, the Pixel 4 improves on what Google achieved with its already great Pixel 3s. When you're shooting with that main camera, there is more detail to be found. Exposure is handled better, so brightly lit spots aren't blown out. And even colors feel just a little more impactful, a little more sumptuous. Low light performance is generally really nice too, though I have to say the way that Pixel processes its photos means images captured in the dark sometimes look more blue than they really should. It's kind of weird. With just a few exceptions though, the results are great. When you're shooting with that two times telephoto camera, the results are obviously nicer than what you'd get with the Pixel 3's software zoom, but to me, it's still the weaker of the two cameras. I sometimes notice a significant shift in white balance when switching from the wide camera to this one, and even though it shoots at a higher resolution, the results do kind of come out fuzzy sometimes in anything but the best lit situations. If nothing else though, it's a good team player. It does a solid job helping the main camera take really striking portraits, and it ensures that those super res zoom photos look better than they would have otherwise. Do those full on eight times zoom photos look good enough to hang on a wall? No, I mean, probably not, but they'll do in a pinch when you absolutely can't get any closer to your subject. Google also added a few new creature comforts here, like Live HDR+, which gives you a real-time preview of what your photos will look like after they've been processed, and two exposure control sliders so you can more easily give your photos the tone you're looking for. Oh, and about that new astrophotography stuff in the night sight mode, well, look, it's really hard to test a feature like this when you live in New York, but I'm pretty proud of the results the Pixel produced. Just take a look. Night Sight is still a great option, even when you're not taking photos of the stars, but there are more sample photos and impressions in my full written review, which you should definitely read. But I will leave you with this. Apart from the rare quirk or two, the Pixel 4's cameras are easily my favorite out of all of the Android phones I've tested this year, but it faces some incredible competition in the form of the iPhone 11 Pro. Apple has improved by leaps and bounds this year, to the point where even I was kind of shocked, and in most of my test shots, the 11 Pro did a better job of capturing detail. On the other hand, the Pixel 4's photos generally had deeper, more appealing colors, though they were a little less true to life. The camera rivalry between these companies has never been fiercer, and as always, I think which of these cameras are ultimately better kind of boils down to what you like. As for me, I've been going back and forth all week. At this moment, I prefer the flexibility and the clean look of the iPhone 11 Pro, but the Pixel is right there and I keep bouncing back. I can't make up my mind. At the end of it all, Google didn't get everything right with the Pixel 4 and the 4XL. Face unlock is in need of a fix, the batteries are questionable, and motion sense, as magical as it can feel, just doesn't do much yet. Despite that, I can't help but love these phones with their clean software and their fantastic cameras and their ambition. The Pixel 4s feel like something of a transitional step between the status quo and the future of smartphones. They were bound to be a little awkward, but they get enough right that I still think they're worth considering. <laughs>